Um, I'm Jocelyn Maudsley and I teach EU politics at uh, Newcastle University, which has become a remarkably interesting thing to do <laughs> in recent weeks, months, and uh, yes. Um, I think for those of you who are new to the region, it may just be helpful before I introduce our roundtable panellists, uh, just to explain a little bit about the context of where you find yourself. Uh, you are in a Remain voting city, uh, but a city that is surrounded by a remarkably leave voting uh, hinterland. Uh, we are also a city that is a, seen as a Labour heartland, uh, hence why we have two representatives of the Labour Party on the <laughs> panel. Uh, and <coughs> it is fair to say, I think, that the city could be viewed as left-leaning. Um, <laughs> it has, um, it is a region whose traditional industries like shipbuilding, mining have long since diminished uh, and in which regeneration strategies have been trying to, including with the help of European Union money, uh, been trying to regenerate the region for the last 20 years or so. And I think the record has had some success, particularly here in Newcastle itself. Um, but that means that Brexit has particular challenges for our region. And that is what we have asked our panellists to reflect on today. And with us today, we have, starting from the far end, Judith Curtin Darling, who is one of our three MEPs for the Northeast region. Uh, we have Thomas Poitz, who is the Executive Director of the Tyneside Cinema, uh, and who has been involved in a lot of EU-funded projects. Great cinema in Europe. <laughs> we have Julie Underwood, who is joining us from the North East Chamber of Commerce. And finally, we have one of our local Labour MPs, Chio Mora, who recently held the distinction of being the first elected <laughs> MP to the House of Parliament <laughs> when Newcastle beat Sunderland <laughs> in the race to the club. <laughs> so, what I suggest is that we go in this order and each of our panellists speak for uh, 10 minutes or so, and then we move to questions and answers. Uh, so, if that's okay, I'll give the floor to... Judith. North East MEPs, um, Paul Brannan, another Labour MEP, and Jonathan Arnott, a UKIP MEP. And we're um, in the strange position of being something uh, between a white rhino and a dodo. Uh, we're still on our feet, so we're still alive, uh, but we're a species which will be extinct uh, very shortly, um, if, if this, depending on what happens in the next few years. Uh, so I'll give you my perspective as a kind of footloose politician, if you like. Um, because I have um, no personal stake. I'm not running for anything else. Um, I'm intending to see out my full term in the European Parliament, and that gives a, um, that gives a liberty in terms of analysing what's happened and thinking about what the implications of what's happened um, are. The day after the referendum, what we saw in the European Parliament was quite interesting uh, because it showed, um, and I'm speaking just from a North East perspective now, it showed the fragmentation of the UK. The day after the referendum, immediately Nicola Sturgeon turned up in Brussels and said, this is what Scotland wants after the referendum, after the referendum result. Uh, the day after that, the leader of Wales arrived and said, this is what Wales wants. Sadiq Khan came from London and said, this is what London wants. And what we were very aware about was that there were no voices saying what the north of England wanted. And yet the north of England, and particularly the North East, has one of the biggest stakes in this discussion about how we leave the European Union and what our future relationship with the European Union looks like. And that's, it's been alluded to, um, that's because as one of the poorest regions in England, we have been um, a massive recipient of European funding. Uh, we, at some points, we've been a net recipient of European funding compared to our contribution uh, to the EU. Um, and that funding has basically underpinned our whole regional 
um, development strategy. It's underpinned a lot of the investment. Every building, more or less, that you see, new building across the northeast, infrastructure investment, skills and training, development of business, lots of it has European money somewhere in it. But we're also an export region. Uniquely in the UK, we're the only region which consistently exports more than it imports. We have a trade surplus. And that trade surplus is with the, European, the rest of the European Union. So our trade relationship with the EU is really, really important. Any shift or change in rules or the, um, the organisation of our trade relationship will have a knock-on effect on business in the North East. I don't want to scaremonger because I don't believe in scaremongering. But to give you an idea, we reckon there are about 160,000 jobs across the region that are dependent on our, that trade relationship in terms of the European single market. So in terms of a region which is one of the poorest regions in the UK, has some of the highest unemployment levels, um, but also has this trade surplus, our relationship with the EU and the ongoing relationship is really vital for the North East future. And the irony is also that we voted in the largest numbers to leave, despite it being in perhaps our best interest to remain. Um, the arguments didn't get through, and we can discuss um, why that was, but um, in the North East we had a massive leave vote. So uh, we have this funny situation where we voted in effect in a rational way, we voted against our own self-interest and our, against our own um, economic development. Effectively the North East voted to make itself poorer in the future uh, because any shift away from that close European Union membership will be a lesser economic relationship and therefore will have some knock-on effect um, on our economy. So after the uh, vote we saw all of these political leaders representing different regions and Paul and I were very concerned that the North East not be left out and that we ensure that there be a regional voice heard about what was important for the North East. But we'd campaign to remain so our credibility and MEPs credibility is already perhaps quite low um, but our credibility after the referendum was even lower so what we thought was that we had to do a widespread consultation across the region to ask what the region thought was important post Brexit so we undertook a consultation immediately from uh, we dusted ourselves down we had a weekend off and then we got up and we started and we consulted with all of the regional organizations the Chamber of Commerce cultural organizations the trade union movement the church sector, the churches, the uh, voluntary sector and individuals. We had a public um, a, a website which allowed individuals to give what they thought um, we should prioritise. And the, con the results of that consultation were very strong. Um, and they were that the top priority for actors across the North East was that economic argument that people wanted to defend our position inside the customs union at the very least and the single market um, ideally. And that's because of the link to jobs in most cases. There's a very strong united voice from the trade union movement and from business both calling um, for the same thing. The second point was about funding. We've seen um, how Westminster has um, allocated funding um, sometimes with some political bias about where money, I'm trying not to be too party political, but <laughs> some political bias about where money is spent in the country. The European Union al calculates its spending according to GDP and where you fall in terms of average GDP. It's a very cold economic needs calculation which isn't used in Westminster. And what we argued was that the North East should not lose out pound for pound according to our previous um, uh, funding and that we needed new models of regional development funding and new models of regional development to ensure that regions like the North East would prosper and that you wouldn't see post-Brexit a sucking of the UK economy into the South East and London, which is um, a real danger. And having proper... Um, regional development fund, funds is crucial um, to ensure that. So funding was <coughs> the second big issue. The third was something which came out very strongly, which was about rights and protections. Many people in the North East value their employment rights, and most of our employment law comes from the European Union. So rights to paid annual holiday, rights to in terms of inter, 
equal treatment between men and women, um, anti-discrimination legislation, lots of that is European law. And people were concerned about what happens to those rights when we leave the European Union. Um, and specifically, more specifically to the North East, if you look at environmental protection legislation, that's actually transformed this region. I grew up on Teesside um, in the 70s and 80s, and there was coal tar all along uh, the beaches that we swam in uh, when we were kids. Um, and European bathing water legislation has transformed the northeast coastline, cleaning up beaches, meaning that our, our rivers, our beach, our seas, and um, urban water supplies are transformed in terms of um, public health. That's crucial in a region where, because of the poverty, we have big health inequalities. And environmental protection legislation is often actually public health legislation. It's framed in a different way, but that's what it's about. And that legislation is really crucial for this region. And the last point, which was one of the strongest points, was the feeling that we're, we're kind of squeezed between Holyrood and Westminster, and we don't have a voice. We don't have a loud enough voice as a region in national debates. We had a voice in Europe because we were able um, to, because we were recognised as a, a region needing more help. Um, but that voice will disappear and we need to build that regional voice. So those were the <coughs> conclusions of our consultation. But maybe one um, thought, and one of the biggest challenges that I think we have as a region, and then I'll stop, but one of the biggest challenges that I think we have as a region um, kind of going forward is linked to the Brexit vote. We voted massively to leave. Lots of that vote was about immigration. It wasn't just about EU immigration, it was about um, immigration in general. On the doorstep, we got people expecting that if they voted to leave, there would be a halt to Southeast Asian immigration. They expected that established communities in the Northeast who were born and bred in the Northeast would somehow disappear as a result of voting to leave the European Union. Now, you can argue how completely irrational and ignorant this is, but this is what people's perceptions were. But the, the tragedy, I think, for that I see, is that as a region, we are the quickest ageing region in the UK. Our population is ageing very quickly, and we have massive skills gaps already in lots of sectors. And as a result of, of that, what we actually need in the future is more immigration. It doesn't matter if people are coming from London or from um, Lanzarote or somewhere else, beginning with L somewhere else in the world, <laughs> but the, the inward migration of people to ensure if we want to maintain our quality of life in the North East. Um, and we have effectively voted the direct opposite. And that, to me, is the biggest challenge that we face in the future, because we need to have a serious conversation in this region about how valuable immigration is for our region and how important migration is in terms of our economic development. We've, se we've seen a massive drop in the number of EU nationals applying to work in the public sector. We're seeing people already, before anything's happened, we should, you know, nothing really has changed, and yet we're seeing an exodus of EU nationals from the university sector, students, um, from the rest of the public sector and we as a region will be specifically hit by that exodus and that is for me the really big challenge but I sit with my feet in both sides of this game because as a member of the European Parliament we're privy to all of the negotiation strategy of the EU side of the negotiations whilst also getting an eye when they want to give it to us um, an eye into the government strategy of what they're doing so it's quite a, an interesting time to have a seat, a ringside seat on history, I would say. Um, and sometimes a ringside seat on history means you're much closer to seeing the chaos of what's actually going on. So I'm happy to answer any questions, and they're just my opening thoughts. And it's very hard to follow a speaker <laughs> of your caliber, I must say. But uh, yeah, so I, interestingly, was here the night before the, uh, the, the referendum, the night of the referendum, sitting in a hotel because I had my, my interview for the role of executive at the next morning. And I was following it 
<laughs> unfolds. Luckily, Newcastle came first, and for to remain, I was really relieved. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to remain in the European Union, and now I have to go to bed and get make sure that I'm fresh from the interview tomorrow. <laughs> to then wake up to the reality of Brexit, mm -hmm. and um, that was quite a shock. But then, of course, the first question in my interview was, <laughs> if you would have been in post as director of Townside Cinema, and you saw yourself confronted with this outcome, what would you do? <laughs> and then we had a very interesting discussion. First, I managed to shock them all by saying, well, I would abolish the one pound entrance fee for the unemployed. And they're all like, he says, well, you're all going to be unemployed. <laughs> England is going to slide into a big recession and maybe a depression that will not recover from for the next uh, two generations. Then they, when I realized that they were really, truly shocked, I said, no, no, it, it, it's a joke. <laughs> but they made a good discussion. And basically I said, well, what's you can see from this outcome is that these big discussions about big issues, global issues, big societal issues, we, we can't leave them to, to politicians with, with, with <laughs> <laughs> um, excuses about like this with two politicians at the table, but we, and I said we can't leave them to, to uh -oh. the media either. And these discussions have to take place in society, mm. at places where people congregate, where they come together, such as cultural venues, and especially in a venue like Tenzin Cinema, where we have like the, the great luxury of incredible like, equipment, screens with 4K projection to show films and documentaries that can help people contextualize the issues. And that can also be used as an introduction for discussions. So basically, in this discussion, we decided that this is, was what we were going to do. Luckily, I had a board, people were all realizing this was not going the way that they also would have wanted this. But we realized we, we, we had to do something and just start immediately. So it was during this interview, on the day that the results came out, that we decided, okay, we're going to reinvent the inside cinema. Not, not only as a cinema, but as a center for discussion and debate. A place where people come together to to, to deal with the big issues in society. And so um, we started recently with a program on the impact of climate change, on the refugee crisis. We're now working on a program under the title What's Left, looking back at the 100 Years of Revolution, and we have other programs in the pipeline. And uh, so this was a great interview. You can say probably that I ended up getting my job because of Brexit and because of the discussion <laughs> that followed. <coughs> And then after the interview, I still had some time before I had to go back to Oxford, where I lived at the moment, and um, went to the beach, took to the metro to, to Wakely Bay and walked to Tynemouth. And then during that walk, I got a phone call from the chair whether I wanted to uh, accept the role. Or she, she said, we want to offer you the role. And she immediately asked, do you still accept in the light of <laughs> Brexit? I said, yes, I do. And uh, let's make something of this idea to, to, to create a center for debate. And, but then later, realizing like, how everything had unfolded and what, uh, what had happened, I realized that this initial remark of mine to abolish the one pound entrance fee had not that much, been that much of a job. I, it, it became a job when I saw how shocked they were, but I'm really concerned about this because at the moment, if, that moment, I was living in Oxford, but I had been doing a fellowship at London Business School, Sloan Fellowship. I was uh, like running an investment management company with a few partners from London Business School. And we had been looking for funding from private equity and venture capital for projects in Suriname, in, in the Amazon, in Latin America, in Indonesia, in the Netherlands. And nobody was interested. Because they didn't know the, the region, they didn't know the, 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 the local political situation. And so I had ended up going to, to Dutch private equity for those projects. I managed luckily to find them, uh, found them and, uh, like through other means. But in the city, everybody closed their door upon it, as interesting as they thought the projects were. The day after did this referendum happened and, and the, EU for, the, the, the UK voted to leave the EU, they were all back on the phone. They had decided to diversify their portfolio 
um, geographically. They're not investing in the UK anymore. And this is very worrying. If people stop investing in, in their own country and start investing abroad to, to spread their risk, then you're in trouble. And you see it already now that I guess inflation here is 3%, six times higher than it was before the referendum. And to make it worse, I was living in Oxford with friends who were working at Jaguar Land Rover. Their first reaction was, we're not going to invest anymore in Oxfordshire. We're going to invest in our plants in Slovakia. And if, if, if there at that moment, it was still the idea, if like Article 50 is going to be triggered, we're going to move. Of course, at this moment, everybody is waiting to see. People are still hoping there will be a U-turn and or a miracle or <laughs> or both. And um, but in the meantime, it is becoming more and more clear that more than 50% of the CEOs of big companies who are operating internationally, globally, are considering a leave. And and I still have my house in Amsterdam, and I just see the prices going up from people shopping there for real estate. Not only in Amsterdam, it's happening in Frankfurt, in Paris, in in Dublin, and and the first. The companies from the financial sector are already moving. I think that the Deutsche Bank was the first big bank to move out of London to Dublin. And I am really concerned back about the knock-on effect. Once back, back Brexit is really triggered, things will disintegrate. And in the meantime, I see that there, there, there are all these reflexes to try and and, and 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 make it smaller. People are saying that even even business people who should know better well, but we are doing well. Our shares are going up, and I'm saying yes, sure they're going up um, because money is very cheap at the moment. Interest rates are kept really low by the Bank of England, so you have money to invest. But I said more importantly, I told tell them that more importantly, they might be going up. But are they going up with regards to the pound or to the euro? He said, well, make that calculation. And then if you start looking at it, yes, the, 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 sh the share prices are going up, but not with regard to the euro. They go up in pounds. And it's just an adjustment to inflation and uh, the pound becoming less valuable. And all those companies, they trade globally. So yes, th th their share prices are going up. It doesn't mean that it's going well. And and there are so many of these reflexes I see, people trying to say, well, it's not as bad and we might be okay. But I, I, my feeling is it, it's probably going very, to become very hard, very difficult um, when, when like, the, the, the Brexit is really going to happen. And then things that might now still be manageable and, and, and obviously might just be come crumbling down really fast. And then, and back to my first impression on that morning of Brexit, thinking, yes, then we're all going to be in the middle of the in, in the meantime, it includes me, then we're all going to be unemployed and in, in a big crisis. So I'm going to stop with this very negative thought and pass on to someone who is probably like as cheerful in her approach as like I will try. the red that you radiate. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. I think <laughs> Thomas has just managed to beat me for the most depressing person on Brexit <laughs> at really? Newcastle University. <laughs> well, right. You're welcome. <laughs> okay, so a brief overview of the Chamber and what a Chamber of Commerce is, um, some commentary on business views on EU negotiations and Brexit, and what the Chamber is doing to help champion the region and support businesses to be ready for Brexit. And also um, highlight some potential opportunities that may arise, which is a bit of a positive uh, <laughs> element to the debate. So this sort of local trade perspective I would like to bring. So the North East England uh, is a proud exporting region that boasts an array of iconic manufacturing businesses, a strong and wide breadth of supply chains, and strong trade ties with international markets. The North East England Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber, champions the North East as a global trading region. Um, in the Chamber's 2017 manifesto, which represents over 3,000 businesses, because the Chamber of Commerce, we represent businesses in the North East and we lobby on behalf of business. 
um, we emphasise um, how to champion a global northeast, making the regions as attractive as possible to overseas investors and markets. And in the past, we've campaigned on a range of issues to tackle these challenges, from promoting overseas trade visits to highlighting northeast England as a tourism destination. We've also promoted the benefits of companies re reshoring production here from overseas and campaign for the control of air passenger duty, which is another important uh, element, and making sure our exporting businesses are heard through changing international policy. And that's really one of the key areas that we will be fo we focus on, but we'll be looking to focus on even more uh, in this uh, particular time. But on a practical note, and on my slide you'll see we have the three, the three logos there of the Chamber, the Department for International Trade, which is the, the government um, department that delivers export support and which we deliver on behalf of the Department for International Trade, and the European Union flag, because we also deliver our own European programme, um, which we help to use to support companies. We offer financial incentives to help to support them with their exporting plans. So we have a very comprehensive offer for businesses trading overseas, so we can practically support them. So this includes operational support and training about documentation and legislation. We currently produce the certificates of origin, which are needed for Nissan to get their cars shipped around the world. So on a practical note, we are involved in, the, in a supply chain of our exporting businesses. We deliver the services for the Department of International Trade with um, around approximately 18 advisors working across the region that work with companies to help them develop their exports. That's either get them exporting for the first time or ask, looking at them to um, develop new markets, either within the EU or outside of the EU. So there's a lot of practical support. Our role as the Chamber means we are very close to business. And after the recent election, um, Chamber members were surveyed through a British Chamber of Commerce survey to ask about their views and priorities in the up and coming negotiations and specifically around the single market and the customs union. And I just want to share some of these results with you. So the results were that 88% of North East respondents um, indicated they wished to remain in either the single market, the customs union or both. So that's quite a high, a high percentage there. And when you break that down, 52% wanted to remain in the single market and customs union, 24 just in the single market, and 11 just in the customs union. So it certainly indicates that businesses in the region want to continue to be able to access EU markets with little change to the current arrangements. And this ties into the region's strong exporting success, where in 2016, over 60% of the northeast exports went to the EU bloc alone. So that is the main exporting uh, market for northeast companies. And interestingly, second to that um, is the United States. And if you break that down even further, if you look at the EU countries as individual markets, Germany, and the last set of statistics was our um, top exporting market, followed by the United States. So that's still um, a really important market to us. Also, we think the, the recent general election sort of showcased how business is not getting near enough consultation and engagement as it should be, particularly considering the importance of the EU as in terms of trade and access to talent that businesses need to fill both short and long-term skills shortages. We also touched through the survey on tr transitional arrangements and 40% of respondents wish to see a transition period of three years following the end of negotiations in March 2019, and 20% of more than three years. So businesses are concerned about the transition and what will happen, and the timescales that they'll need to embed different means of working. Within the survey, there were further questions, referring specifically to the negotiation process, and our members indicated three key priorities which were tariffs, non-tariff taxation, and public procurement regulations. And then regarding the priorities for the future trade relationship with non-EU countries, the top three priorities were work permits and visas, public procurement regulations, and non-tariff ta non taxation. We also asked companies about what their future plans will be regarding investment into exporting. 
and I'll just share these with you. Um, and number one, is at the top in the middle there, 35% of North East businesses are planning to put additional resources into exporting to Europe over the next five years. So that's what results in capital investment and market development. With the states um, being second, second priority with 26%, and then over to Asia and Australasia with 22, 23. So that gave us a clear indication of where that investment and resource will go. And interestingly, 75%, uh, which is really important, of Northeast businesses surveyed are sold or sourced goods, either to or from the EU. So from the survey, we've, which is very timely, we've, we've gathered a lot of intelligence. And I think now it's, well, how does the Chamber, with this feedback, continue to champion the region and support businesses to be ready for Brexit and maximise opportunities? Because a lot of the conversations I've had with companies recently is... They don't like the uncertainty. That's really, really difficult. It's challenging times. But what they also can't do is sit back and wait. They can't wait till March 2019 and then have to address increased in costs, skill shortage. So they have to do some scenario planning now. So how do we help? The Chamber runs an international trade committee, which is made up of a wide range of our key exporting businesses, from professional service providers to goods exporters. And through the committee, we formulate policies and help to decide the direction of future, cam future campaigns, as well as debate the current challenges facing exporters. Recently, a, de a delegation of committee members, alongside other key chamber global traders, met with ministers uh, from the Department of Exeter in the EU and also the Department for International Trade, and met them in Parliament to advise them what key northeast businesses want. And we think this sort of di dialogue, and Judith, you alluded to this as well, we need to maintain that. We need to keep groups of businesses that we can facilitate and gather together to be talking to ministers directly. And on the ground, we support businesses through our Key Chamber Global Membership Package, which provides exporters with a wide range of specialist services to support overseas trade, from documentation to, and guidance and compliance. We have our international trade advisors that I've mentioned, which provide expert advice on a range of issues, whether it's gaining access to new markets, payment terms, shipments of goods or new legislation, plus our ERDF programme. So there is a lot of help and support for businesses out there who are currently trading and we will try and help them navigate whatever the new landscape may or may not look like. But recently, um, we've been working on a dedicated work piece called the Brexit Toolkit. Uh, with an additional company and this is an online um, system and this can be used for companies identifying their commodity codes and then looking at what the poten potential scenario would be um, if those codes reverted back to the World Trade Organization um, tariff regime and we had we showcased this at a recent event called Britain after Brexit and it gave businesses an insight into what potentially expect from the up and coming challenges in the processes. I think one of the, the key things from that particular event is a, um, a significant North East manufacturer was there and actually did the, the case study where they'd highlighted the top 100 components that are currently moving freely around the EU and then coming into the North East to be assembled to, to a finished product. So they'd looked at their top 100 <coughs> components and thought potentially, well, how, how if we move all of this to WTO tariff, how, what sort of impact that will that be? 3% increase. And they originally thought it was going to be much, much higher. So they can now look at their business and think, well, 1.83% on a cost base. Actually, we can probably do something about this. And I mentioned opportunity, and they're looking at that as an opportunity. They're saying, well, if we could look at our components, if we could just tweak the specification slightly, could we source them in the UK? So there, this is where we, we will potentially have some opportunity uh, when businesses start to look at them. Now, they are unique, you know, and there will be different variances. There'll be some that have much higher cost implications. But the message businesses are telling us is they need to start considering it now. And they can't wait. They've got to have plans in place for how to react should certain changes take place. So this has been quite a, a key development in the Chamber service over recent months, having this toolkit and working with business on, on some scenario planning. 
So next steps, the support, the practical support is really important and businesses are pragmatic and getting on with it. And the ones we talk to are very much, well, you know, at the moment, X, Y and Z are my main priorities, but we need to get up in the morning, we need to carry on doing what we're doing. But they also need to plan for inevitable changes, for uncertainties and unknowns. Entrepreneurs are good at dealing with this, that's why they're entrepreneurs. But we're talking to companies and companies are asking us how can they start to put themselves in the best position they can be in to deal with the challenges. I think the next slide is just quite an interesting, a bit of a different approach in how you can become Brexit ready and how we're working with businesses to help them do this. And firstly, spread your risk. We know there's a huge amount of trade between uh, the North East and the, and the European Union. But is the potential to diversify into other markets? Are there other opportunities? Do you know people who are producing a similar product that are already exporting outside the EU? So there's a key theme of diver um, diversifying your risk and businesses need to look at that. Leadership and vision. At this time, I think we really do need visionary leadership within our, our businesses and within um, the business community. Because there's going to be an awful lot of noise over the next months and years. A lot of it will be negative noise. And business leaders who are running businesses will have employ employees who will be reading things in the press, they'll be hearing things. And they need to be able to, to manage that stress within their businesses. They be able, need to be able to tell their businesses, well, this is our plan in how we're going to address Brexit. So even though they're still dealing with unknowns, it's having that conversation with, with, their, with their staff to say, yes, this is happening and this is what we, how we're going to plan to tackle it. And we think that's a really important part of this debate for business. But also be ready for the twists and turns. It is not going to be straightforward. We need an adaptable and capable cu culture that can, can manage dealing with this. And businesses need to be more and more aware of that. Work on your business rather than in your business. And this is quite crucial. In, because there will be change, businesses, they need leaders, managers who are going to be able to adapt who are going to be able to instigate any new processes that are required, they need to start investing now in having those teams in place. And the pound sign, cost and finance. I've talked about the scenario planning that businesses can start to do um, to look at potential cost implications, but they do need to be resilient. When faced with change, resilience is really important and a lot of that is money in the bank. If you've got money in the bank, you can sort of deal with things um, that may come up unexpected or and that's the sort of message as well businesses are needing to be in a very strong position and finally I'd just like to cover the key policy points we're now working with we've produced this document as the Chamber of Commerce from our lobbying perspective on what are the five key priorities which the government needs to consider to help ensure that North East businesses can grow and prosper and I'm sure they're all things that you're familiar with and do resonate in we need a fair migration system, frictionless and unbureaucratic trade, commitment to ongoing funding, partnerships and collaboration, and minimum disruption. And as a Chamber of Commerce, we will continue to ensure that the voice of business continues to be heard during these negotiations. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, thank you very much for um, inviting me today. Um, the, um, the disadvantage of going um, last after three such excellent uh, speeches or in, uh, um, interventions is that um, there's not very much uh, left to say that hasn't already been said. Um, the advantage is that means that I can talk about almost whatever I want to yeah. talk about <laughs> with regard to Brexit. And there is an awful lot to be talked about <laughs> with regard to Brexit. Um, I'm just, I'm, I've said I have to, I have to leave at 10.30 um, because I'm getting the train down to London to go to Parliament, Westminster, to actually question the um, Home Secretary about a police cut here in Newcastle. Uh, but in Parliament, you know, I've come back to Parliament after the snap general election the last uh, two weeks where we've had all the, the debates and the, about how much to bribe the DUP with and uh, where the money is going to come from, or the magic money tree as it happens, it clearly has come from. Uh, but I've, had, I've started this sort of game um, whereby I sort of count how long it takes. Whatever my meeting is about, whether it's about police cuts or 
it's about um, industrial strategy, I'm the shadow minister for industrial strategy, or it's about uh, the creative arts in Newcastle, as I was discussing last week. You know, I see how long it would take to um, talk, to make for Brexit to come up, you know, in any meeting, whatever the subject is. And I will say, you know, that the longest so far has been 10 minutes, you know, which, I, which you know, which, it was quite good, actually. <laughs> uh, I forget what the meeting was about. I think it was about something like um, in uh, school cuts, actually. So, uh, so yes. Yeah, so ten minutes. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion um, in, oh, in Parliament, in Westminster, in Whitehall right now about Brexit. I think it is clear, and one of the dangers, the risks, which is, is that it is sucking all the sort of intellectual and speculative air out of any other, any subject. So finding time to focus on funding for the metro or on police cuts or all the other areas um, when the Brexit debate has been highly, highly successful. Brexit has already proved to be successful job creation for lawyers and <laughs> consultants. Um, um, which you may find an attractive proposal. Um, as the process of Brexit gets so much uh, debate and discussion. Uh, but I think there's also another um, element to this, and in the list of um, people who came over to Brussels, Jude, that you mentioned, I was surprised that you didn't include me. Because no. <laughs> I went to Brussels last year, I went to Brussels about three, year, three days after Brexit. It wasn't intentional, I was on my way actually to the Somme, because of the, um, the 100th anniversary of the, the Battle of the Somme in 2016. But I was in Brussels for, for two days and I met with um, m mainly um, socialist and uh, Labour, the Labour grouping of, of MEPs. And what was clear to me was a real sense of, of grief, of regret, of emotional, you know, uh, disconnect. Um, and what I, th what I, th you know, what, what I think you know, is that there's a lot of passion and emotion about around Brexit and some of the underlying themes, you know, such as immigration and I'll talk about it, job security, etc. There's a lot of identity. There's a lot of passion there. And right now, a lot of politicians are trying to meet that passion with process. And, you know, meeting passion with process um, is very, is very difficult and does, I think doesn't work and we need we need a, a future and a vision for Britain uh, that we can be passionate about because part of the Bre Brexit vote as as um, Jude um, said was um, was a, I think was irrational was, but it was also rooted in a profound disillusionment with um, with politicians and with the current economic model and Theresa May's um, election gamble, and I think it's absolutely clear now that it was a gamble, and she lost. She lost. She lost the election. We did not win the election, but she definitely lost it. Um, was all about getting a blank check for a particular form of Brexit, with a, a reckless, hard Brexit. And what was clear to me, yeah. I voted to remain, um, but Newcastle, Newcastle voted to remain. But as Judith said, the North East voted to leave. But what was clear to me was that nobody voted to lose their job. Nobody actually voted to have their neighbour kicked out of the country. And nobody voted, well, apart from a, a, a couple of people whose names I shan't say, voted for a destructive Trumpian alt-right vision of Brexit that the Theresa May's government was pushing. And that's the Brexit that they are still pursuing despite their humbling at the polls and despite their bumbling approach to negotiation and despite all the debates and, in fact, division and leadership contest which is going on in the Tory party right now, that is still the vision of Brexit that they're pursuing which will destroy jobs and ruin livelihoods. Now, the Labour position on Brexit has been um, challenged so we say, and um, we recently had the vote last week where, where 50, um, I think it was 50 Labour MPs voted against, our, voted for an additional, uh, actually they voted for an additional amendment, they didn't vote against the Labour amendment, they voted for an additional amendment on the, on the single market. Uh, but it, I think 
whilst in terms of process and in terms of the, 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 the legal definitions around the membership of the single market, it may be, um, um, it, it may not be, abs it's not always absolutely clear. What's very clear for me and for what's very clear for our front bench is that it's about putting the economy first. So that's why we talk about a jobs first Brexit and want, certainly not a Brexit that makes us poorer or less secure. And I, I think that's the right approach, partially because, you know, it, you know prosperity of our country, it is, it is the economy stupid, it's often, you know, but also because it is something that we can be, be passionate about and it's something that really most people, I, I always say as a Labour MP for, well, you know, one of, the, one of the poorest areas, one of the poorest wards in, my, in, the, in the country here in Newcastle Central, but if everybody in Newcastle Central had a job, had a good job, not a zero hours, you know, zero, um, zero co hours contract job, you know, my casework would almost disappear. Uh, you know, there might still be some um, some policy casework, but the actual casework, the actual, would, would almost disappear. So that's um, so we are we are focused on a jobs first Brexit and. In terms of you know, the, the vote itself, one of the things which makes me very um, angry as a North Easterner, as a Geordie and as a, as a Labour MP, is all the commentators who blame the negative effects of Brexit, uh, the rise in hate, hate crimes, which we have definitely seen, and the paralysing e economic uncertainty on the northern working class, or they call it the northern white working class, when they're trying to be even more specific. You know, those left behind by globalisation, as they say. And that's particularly ironic, given that Brexit was actually led by a Surrey stockbroker and an old Etonian. Uh, um, but uh, that said, we have to recognise that the vote was in part driven by our economic model, which in which 3.8 million workers across the UK are working in poverty. So when I talk about everybody having a job, sort of cutting down my casework, you know, a good job, for almost 4 million working people, so they've got jobs, but they're in poverty. You know, and it's a model just seen the North East workers lose out almost £4,000 per year on average compared to 10 years ago. So everybody on average sort of is poorer than they were 10 years ago. The vast majority of people are poorer than they were 10 years ago. And um, a third of children in Newcastle live in poverty, and one in 20% of my constituents claim benefits. And it's also a model, and let's also be clear about this, neither Brussels nor Whitehall was seen as listening or understanding. And I think it's actually that economic model which drove the Brexit vote that we had last June. Now, Jude has talked about, uh, Jude and, and um, Julie, in fact, have talked about the, the challenges that Brexit face poses, particularly for our region, because of our um, reliance on um, European Union funding, also because of our fact that we've got a, tra a balance of trade surplus, the only region to have that, um, 160,000 jobs in the region linked to our membership. Also, um, yeah, our universities, we have great universities, I'm sitting in one now, um, received 155 million in EU funds in the current funding cycle alone. <coughs> the North East, uh, which we are profoundly outward looking in terms of trade, particularly in internationalist region. When you look at our history of the labour movement founding the crop, you know, the foundations of the cooperative movement, the free trade movement, all in this region. Um, we need a future, we need a vision for the future which creates good jobs and which looks outwards to the world. Um, and at, you know, I'm the Shadow Minister for Industrial Strategy. We are working, our proposals are for a high wage, high growth economy that provides people with the jobs and skills they need. Our mission that we set out in our Industrial Strategy uh, paper uh, was to deliver an innovation nation creating a million good jobs, the definition of good jobs, working with the private sector and to have the highest number of skilled jobs in the OECD by 2030. Um, so, you know, I'm, it, yeah, that is what we fear, what I fear, is that whilst people felt that Brussels was very distant, 
the fact is in the northeast that Whitehall is very distant as well. Uh, and I spoke about, I mean, I, I have these, co I, I have conversations I cannot actually repeat because I'm too ashamed of them, uh, explaining to Whitehall pe officials where the northeast is, you know, the fact that actually the northeast does have links across the world and might be interested in exporting somewhere other than to other than uh, London, you know, and um, and what the attractions of the northeast are in terms of attracting talent from across the world, in terms of our fantastic um, quality of life, uh, brilliant outdoor, you know, just very basic conversations, and, for, and so. Whilst, you know, and I recognise, and I'm sure you do as well, Jude, the reasons why people felt that Brussels was distant and unaccountable. The fact is that Whitehall is pretty distant and unaccountable mm -hmm. for most Geordies. And we need, so part, certainly I see part of my role is to, wh whatever the outcome on the kind of Brexit that we have, and we are certainly in the Labour Party going to be, you know, we want to, our motion was about retaining the exact same benefits of re as remaining in the single market. But my job is also to hold this government, such as it is, if you can call it a government, um, accountable in terms of the implications for their Brexit measures <coughs> on the North East. And I think that um, working, you know, working together, we can look to ensure a Brexit which actually um, gives us the opportunities to achieve what you set out um, in uh, a, a tariff-free access to the single market, retain the environmental and the um, working rights uh, that we have, or we will have to, um, or, you know, I think we will face a, a sort of the future that Thomas set out, um, and I think people will then, people will then rebel against that, and we'll be in a, we will have another sort of state of disillusionment with politicians and with business, as we're seeing. Um, which will be the sort of dystopian future. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> uh, I certainly would agree with uh, your last point about uh, Westminster being as distant as Brussels. Uh, shortly after the Scottish referendum, I found myself at a reception at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. I was being asked by an official to explain the phenomena of Scottish nationalism. Mm. And, you know, I did my best. Mm. And it then turned out they fought Newcastle was in Scotland. Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some of our officials <laughs> perhaps are not as aware of us as they really were. <laughs> um, but I'm sure those presentations have raised lots of questions amongst the audience. So can we move over to questions and answers? Uh, I suggest we take a couple of questions at a time. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Uh, well, I'm sorry, Peter, that you've uh, chosen to go to the Lib Dems, but um, democracy is a great thing and we need lots of different voices and that's um, good in my view. Um, in terms of Northern Voice or North East, it's a question of um, the critical mass in my view and in some cases the voice is better if it's louder with commun different communities across the north working together um, and in some cases it will be important that our voice is heard as a region now you're completely right we're the most fragmented we've been for a generation as a region uh, partly through devolution and the failure of the devolution deal in the northeast um, combined authority area, um, but also as a result of the dissolution of the regional development agencies right after the, um, when it was the coalition government, I won't blame the Lib Dems directly, but um, when it was the coalition government in 2010, and the dissolution of the regional development mm. agencies, who were loved and loathed in equal measure, um, has meant that the North East as a region, um, has its voice has been fragmented down and down and down. And you're, it's clear that Teesside now um, sees itself and is um, positioning itself as a, a kind of um, sandwich um, region between Yorkshire and the Northeast. And it's about an identity. But the effect of that has been to reduce the critical mass of our region. We're already the smallest region in the UK. In the European Parliament, we're the smallest group of MEPs. Um, from a UK region. So to fragment that down just reduces 
um, your voice and then you add in the um, the context of devolution and different um, political uh, egos and political agendas in the region and it becomes even more fragmented and we've been pushing very hard as MEPs to say basically get over yourselves um, the time scale for this is extremely short the first stage and um, it'll come I'll come on to it talking about Northern Ireland but the the way that the um, the EU negotiations will go will be two phases uh, the UK government went in saying that they were going to have the fight of the century and then accepted the EU uh, schedule uh, five minutes later. Um, and that schedule means that first, the first phase will be about the divorce. It will be three issues. Uh, the EU citizens' rights, UK, um, UK citizens and the rest of the EU, EU citizens <coughs> in the UK, what their status is in the future, a financial settlement, basic divorce settlement, who owes who what, and how it's going to be paid, and Northern Ireland. They're the three first issues which will be uh, dealt with. And that's going to be done probably within the space of 12 months. Um, and then we will be into um, the framework for what the future relationship looks like, but not the detail of a future agreement. It's very unlikely, I would guess, that we will have real parallel negotiations. So the time scale that we have to actually try and influence the direction of our future and try to get those priorities, whether it's the North East Chamber's priorities, it's the cultural sector's priorities, it's the regional priorities in general, is very, very tight. And I think what's interesting is we are getting the sense that that's being heard. So on Friday, I was in South Shields at um, a big public meeting with all of the councils um, represented with the business sector represented with the cultural sector represented community um, sector uh, and voluntary services represented to try and talk about how do we get that voice together in an ad hoc way not bound by structures and process but a basically a coalition of interest of people and I should say the universities are part of that key actor in that as well but a, a, put a consortium of interest of people who want to ensure that the region's voice is heard, coming together, short, a short set of priorities, and using all of the avenues and all of the different influence we have to get that heard, because I think that's the only way we'll have a voice. In some cases, um, I think that voice is better heard if you then link up with Andy Burnham in Manchester, um, with Liverpool, with... Um, Yorkshire, Leeds and so on because it's actually the sim a very similar concern. EU funding and regional funding, there are alliances to be made with other regions in the UK who are also um, mass uh, beneficiaries of EU funding for example um, there are obviously if there are issues like uh, workers rights and environmental protection which are cross cutting across the whole of the country so there are lots of um, voices to be joined together on those and as you saw from that business survey what we really need urgently I think is that business lifts up its head um, and some businesses put their heads above the parapet and actually explain what leaving the customs union, what leaving the single market would mean for them. I'll give you one very concrete example. Rolls-Royce accounts for 2% of UK GDP. It's absolutely enormous as a company. Mm. One component of a Rolls-Royce engine, which will ultimately come off a production line in Derby, one component will cross the border 40 times before it goes into the engine. Now, leaving the customs union means that there would be a massive paper trail for that component. The, what we're hearing from shop stewards in, in Rolls-Royce, from the company, from others, is we haven't, you know, it's, it's very practical. This will come down to practical difficulties. We haven't got the capacity to store products um, in either side of the border for the amount of time that it would take for the administration. Uh, we haven't, in the UK, got enough people who are... Um, trained and knowledgeable about customs duties because we haven't done it in the scale that we're going to have to do it. <coughs> so there's a question of capacity in many, many different ways. And what the difficult, it's all very well as preparing ourselves, and we must do that. We must have plans in place to prepare ourselves. But we're talking about an extremely short period of time to prepare ourselves. 
So that's the that's part of the difficulty um, in terms of in terms of what's going on, and therefore that voice can be different. It's, it's multi-layered in a sense, but I think in the northeast, as a northeast region, my a message, and I've said it directly to council leaders and to others, is get over yourselves. This is too big to let petty differences get in the way of. Um, and um, and I think uh, that's that's got to be the message. And I'm not because I'm not going for anybody's support for anything else. I have a freedom in being able to be <laughs> blunt and rude. Um, and p women from Middlesbrough are well known for their um, diplomacy skills. Um, in terms of Northern Ireland, um, it's in the top three issues uh, that will be dealt with. Uh, it's definitely the easiest of those three because there's a common agreement on every side in the negotiations that nobody wants to see a return to troubles in Northern Ireland. So somehow there will be a resolution of um, the problem of uh, the border uh, between the Republic and, and Northern Ireland. The difficulty will be what the implications are then for Ireland, the Republic of Ireland as an EU member state. Um, and I don't know if people heard on the Today programme this morning there was um, a minority view uh, presented of, uh, from uh, a group in Dublin saying actually the exit of the UK from the EU will mean that our, the Republic of Ireland will also have to follow the UK out of the door because our trading relationship between Ireland and the UK is so much more important to the Republic of Ireland than the, um, the rest of the EU and we're better off negotiating at the same time to try and get a similar deal. Now that is very controversial in the Republic of Ireland because if you feel that cities that voted to remain or regions, Scotland that voted to remain or the North of Ireland that voted to remain feel like they're being dragged out um, kicking and screaming, then a country that didn't even vote being dragged out by, um, uh, by English votes um, is extremely uh, controversial and, and difficult. But there is a real political will to find a solution and that political will is on both sides um, in the negotiations and I just if we're, there's going to be a deal on any of those three issues it will be the Northern Irish one which will be done um, I think first um, and then uh, the, your last point very quickly I think that there are quite a number of initiatives underway to coordinate and link up as I said in relation to Peter's question to link up um, the voices of the North East with other regions which are in a similar uh, situation. Uh, it's much easier where you have a devolved government, a single representative who can, can talk across borders. We know that there's already the um, Metro Mayor's meetings around uh, what it mean, Brexit will mean. We don't have a seat at that table because of things which, you know, the choices that we've made as a region. Um, and, and so, but there are different avenues. Big urban uh, areas, uh, um, and, and, and this makes it much easier to push in, position yourself internationally. And um, then you can suddenly sell the bigger Newcastle as having an airport and a big uh, um, 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 harbor, and, and having um, Nissan and Sitch Gateshead. And I think that like, one of the key things that, like, if I say that, that I have some hope and <laughs> see like something at the horizon that is really giving me like, faith that, 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 that there is a way out of all those things, is that like, at least in the last election many young people went mm -hmm. out to mm -hmm. vote. And I have a feeling when I came here in the UK like, a couple of years ago that there was an incredible apathy. People did not engage with politics. They did, didn't think it would matter whether they went out to vote or not. They have now seen that their voice can make a difference. And I hope that like, young people will also be instrumental in trying to create those bonds and allegiance and bring people together and, and really change things. And, and like the, the whole like, opposition between Newcastle and Sunderland based on history, on soccer or whatever <laughs> it is that has kept them apart like the way like we now saw that young people went out to vote i also think we can also like we, we have to work on on, on 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 making those bonds overcoming like those divisions and uh, 
creating the, the, this voice for, for the North, but also for, for a city like Newcastle and, and, and as a bigger conglomerate. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about Ireland, just that I'm very aware of the issues because my wife is from Northern Ireland. Mm -hmm. So I've been there for the last 20 years, off and on, usually for, in, like, uh, for Christmas, sometimes Easter, to see the, the family and she still, I must say, calls it home, that's going home for her. And uh, I am very concerned. I'm really happy to hear from you that you think it's a top priority mm -hmm. and that it's uh, in good hands and that all parties agree it's that it's, sure it's uh, <laughs> all political players uh, agree that that this is at the top of this but I am very concerned when I hear that you're talking about also the Republic being dragged into this and, and I, I was really shocked to see the last time I was in Ireland at Easter that there were people marching again in IRA uniforms and, and I, I'm Catholic, my wife is Catholic and, and so like we, we have seen the orange marches we have, uh, but, but to see people again standing at the grave singing at, at graves of IRA fighters of died makes me really concerned it, it, it's there there is something coming up again that that's that can totally spiral out of control and the, the problem is those things they can start very sm small and 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 this is with everything that we're talking about now around Brexit that things have knock-on effects and 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 if you don't have that the, the resilience the, the money in the bank then for companies that were end up caught up in those things things can disintegrate very quickly and and, and I am very concerned about it, especially with regards to Ireland but to go back to the hope that I have in young people, is, yes, I, I think first of all there would not have been a Brexit vote if they would have voted in the first place. I was always <laughs> very surprised to hear them blame it on, on the older generation. The older gen generation at least went out and vote. <laughs> and if they would have done this and have voted and turned up uh, back in the same numbers, there would not have been a Brexit. But like, now that they are becoming engaged and politically, not only politically engaged, but also hopefully in other ways engage with society. I hope that, uh, yes, that, that, that we'll see that a uh, U-turn one way or another, like through elections or, but, but I would all like, uh, <laughs> just urge everyone here who, who wants to fight for him to follow Peter's example and just join a political party and, 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 and do what you can. Mm -hmm. Up to you. So thank you. Um, well, I'd just like to pick up on primarily Peter's point because um, the Chamber of Commerce, which we um, we rebranded last year as the North East of England Chamber <laughs> of Commerce, and a lot of that was to do with um, particularly when you're overseas, as I have been and commented, "Oh, where are you from?" Um, North East Chamber, oh, North East work, you know, and it's. It's that understanding of, of how the region is represented and how people perceive the region to be. So that's why we, we changed our name, one of the reasons why. But the Chamber goes back. You know, we celebrated our 200 years um, anniversary last year and started off with the Italian and Weir Chamber of Trade. And then grew and in 1995 um, brought the Teesside Chambers and the Newcastle Tyne and Weir Chambers together as one organisation, because our mantra has very much been, we are stronger together. Now, as a Chamber of Commerce, we don't have a, a political mandate, and we're there to represent the views of our members, and hence why we do the surveys and why we have to have that close, close interaction. But it's so important to have that, that voice, and I think we're probably on our own in some degree as having that united mm -hmm. northeast voice as you know as it says label on the tin mm -hmm. um, and certainly the, the work I do I work closely with the northeast left mm -hmm. I work closely with Te Tees Valley Combined Authority and with the Tees Valley Combined Authority having the mayor I think that the strength <laughs> that brings is quite considerable particularly on an international field because the mayor a metro mayor is an international brand you know, it's it's uh, accepted wherever you go, America, South Africa. It's a really, and they've got this 
this figurehead now within Tees Valley. And you, you think, well, how are we going to get things moving? I totally agree with your point, Julie. It's like, like, look, we've just got to get on with this mm -hmm. uh, and do something. But I think it is, it's important, um, resonating what Julie said, in bringing the organisations together. We work closely with the FSB, the Federation of Small Businesses, with the CBI, which is a national organisation. Um, Entrepreneurs Forum, which is North East, and if we can collectively bring the, the business organisations together to have that strong voice and then work with other organisations as well, whether it's um, MPs, the local authorities, and if we can bring and sort of muster that strength in numbers, then we, I think we do have an opportunity and we have an obligation to, to do that between us um, and try and collectively to and I totally agree, you know, Whitehall is a diff it is a long way, mm -hmm. you know. We try to engage with ministers, we've taken groups of businesses down and sat them in front of um, mm -hmm. Department of International Trade, Department of EU, and we need to do we need to do more of that as much as we can uh, and get those business voices um, heard. Because ultimately it's businesses that will be generating the wealth. It's businesses who will be employing the people. You know, taking into universities the whole group of our economic strength, so we need to represent them uh, and work with them as best we can. And just finally, to touch on the point of the, the EU and, and regions in similar um, situations, I'm certainly talking to many because we have our, our own EU, EU programme um, of how we support businesses trading overseas and how we can perhaps again have a very uh, joined up message in how we would like to see that. Um, continued or replaced, and you know, and try and mitigate against the risk of losing that uh, important, important funding. Mm -hmm. um, Great. Um, I, I have to go together. Yeah, um, it's very interesting on the the, the, the northeast. I mean, uh, you know, the northeast uh, level of integration or, or rivalry is something that um, that I've grown up with, and um, it's much more intense sort of when you're in the northeast than when you're actually in Whitehall or in Brussels where people tend to come together because, um, because of shared experiences and um, you know, the recognition that um, so many people in, in Whitehall think that the North East starts, I oh, don't know where it is to be, to be honest, but um, so you know, the, it's a, the, the Tory Lib Dem coalition abolished the regional development agencies which were a structure to give that voice. You know the mayoral model uh, which we talk about having a figurehead, which is basically based on a sort of big man of politics because it is always a man, you know, all the mayors are men, you know. And I think in the northeast, um, and one of the reasons why we rejected that model, though it is nevertheless looks likely to be imposed upon us, is because we have a more collective view of both a representation, representing and engaging as a region. And um, it, we voted against the mayor because of that and I believe that we need the structures um, to help represent us uh, and not necessarily to have a, a figurehead um, who will ultimately be, it, it's almost and certainly, well, certainly right now, um, all the mayors in the country are men. Um, so I, yeah, I think we need to, I think we need to be able to find, uh, we need to be able to deliver that strong voice in different ways from diff in different organisations and just one other uh, grouping that hasn't been mentioned is the core cities grouping which is the um, the leaders of the you know the, the biggest uh, cities in the UK because there was also a real difference between cities in towns in how people voted cities almost cities overwhelmingly voted to remain within the European Union towns overwhelmingly voted towns in England overwhelmingly voted to leave the European Union and so whilst I think it's a we have the core cities grouping we also do need to um, you know, we need to come together across the different organizations and uh, raise our voices with the in terms of the issues which we're if reflecting and able to represent and just finally on Northern Ireland I agree absolutely with, with, with Jude that it, it, it's a top it's a, it's a top priority and it's a cross party it's been cross party you know from well for, for, for Forever, but particularly, you know, the work that John Major did, what John Major's government did for the um, for the agree for the peace agreement, followed up by Tony Blair's government. It's all it has always been cross-party, and I think as a, so there is a real 
you know, political will there. But I would say I am concerned um, that the top priority of this government is staying in power by whatever means you know necessary, and that is why we have and that the agreement with the DUP, uh, whilst it ensures a Tory majority, um, may, clearly has other economic and political um, agree, um, implications. Right, now I've got to go catch my train. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm feeling really quite sorry for Jude. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, well, the quick answer to the last question is I'm sure that the context does frame the concerns very, very, very clearly. Um, you only have to look at the government's record in terms of UK employment rights um, with the Trade Union Act and with other legislation uh, to raise the fears about what potentially, um, for example, the Great Repeal Bill uh, could have meant in terms of employment rights and, and environmental protections. Uh, so the Great Repeal Bill, before we'll, we'll see what happens now with, um, with Theresa May's government, but, um, but previously we were anticipating that there would have been, a, and that's what we were told by Brexiteer ministers, that there was going to be a bonfire of regulation. Um, and it would have been, and it will be, potentially very, very difficult to defend some very, very crucial bits of legislation, but which are very technical and a bit boring and not particularly sexy. And, and when you look at um, some of the um, government agenda around health and safety, for example, a lot of health and safety legislation is European legislation, um, but it's been in the, the kind of eye of the, the sites of um, Brexiteer um, or neoliberal deregulators who would like a, a footloose deregulated uh, UK, they've seen that health and sa safety legislation as kind of the most burdensome legislation on, on business. Um, and, and so, you know, how we deal with that um, is, is very difficult and the, the lack of faith is partly because of what's already been said on the record by government ministers who would be involved. So, you, yes, you're right. If there'd been a, a period where there'd been a government with regional development, you know, if we were Germany and you had, or, or the Netherlands, and you had regional development funds independently at national level, um, and the EU was on top of a, an existing national process, then there would be a very different sense of faith in what was coming next, I think. Um, I think that's where people feel that there's a cliff edge because we just don't know. Um, uh, in some respects. Um, I'll work backwards because um, I suspect the last question is going to be the most uh, controversial but EU citizens rights is the uh, number one priority for the EU side of the negotiating table. Uh, the EU negotiators Michel Barnier, uh, Juncker, the European Parliament have been absolutely clear that they won't start talking about any economic issues with the UK until there's a deal on EU citizens' rights. And when I talk about EU citizens' rights, we're still EU citizens as British uh, nationals. So it's our rights as well as the rights of um, EU nationals in the UK. The EU side has been pretty detailed in what it, it expects in a deal. Um, it will have to be a reciprocal uh, agreement. Uh, but the EU side would like to see a full respect of all rights, whether people are economically active, economically inactive, um, uh, and, and so on. And the European Parliament's position is the same. And the Labour Party's position has been pretty clear that we want to see European citizens' um, rights uh, fully respected. So uh, my understanding, I was in a hearing with um, Giva Hofstadt, who's the Parliament's chief negotiator, um, a, a month ago, in which he said... And you should remember, we're white rhinos, but we have a power. MEPs, including British MEPs, will get a vote on whatever the Brexit deal looks like. And what's been said already to the negotiating partner, the, the two sides, is if the agreement falls below the Parliament's red lines in terms of citizens' rights, then Guy Verhofstadt will, mo will mobilise for a vote against the agreement. Now, that's a blunt power. We can only say yes or no to the agreement. But if you question, um, you know, uh, you call into question a big red line like that, 
then you really threaten the possibility of there being agree uh, that you, you potentially will see the European Parliament veto uh, the final agreement. You've got to remember this is uh, there are many things in this which are disastrous, but there are many moments which will be coming in the next few months and years which are politically very sensitive. So the negotiations are meant to go to the end of um, next year and there's meant to be a framework deal by the end of next year with the aim that it will be voted in March 2019. In June or May 2019 there will be European Parliament elections and MEPs will already be campaigning from months before that in their, um, in their campaigns. And therefore, if there's any suggestion that their electorate are losing rights, and this becomes an issue in a European election campaign, politicians do crazy things. They make crazy commitments in election campaigns. Uh, they sign up to anything that they think will get them a vote. Not I'm not talking about myself personally, but um, I, think, uh, I think that you will recognise that behaviour. And the danger is that the Brexit agreement becomes a political football in the European Parliament elections and citizens' rights become a political football. And for me, the tragedy of this, and I say, that I say this in every occasion, I'm in the Petitions Committee of the European Parliament, and we have individual citizens come to the Petitions Committee to talk about what Brexit means for their lives. And it's very, very, tra it's tragic in my view that for a year people have been left with an enormous amount of uncertainty about what their basic rights are. And I think that's shameful, actually. I think it's genuinely shameful. We chose to have a referendum. We chose that people, the people who were the most affected by the referendum wouldn't have a voice in the referendum and weren't part of the electorate. And then we haven't had the decency to actually give people a little bit of security about what it means for their life. I think that's shameful. Um, and it's shameful in terms of British nationals who are in the rest of the EU, who also, their lives are completely in, you know, in limbo, and Briti European nationals, other European nationals in the UK. 